Good morning. And still a Merry Christmas to you. As our church year continues in the season of Christmas, setting aside these two Sundays to continue to bask in the joy of God's fulfilled promise of Jesus as our Savior, today we welcome Pastor Charlie Van Evenhoven, uh, serving us today with God's Word. He serves as the Dean of Students at Luther Preparatory School in Watertown. The message of God's Word today shows how he cares for us, just as he cared for his son, making sure that every detail, every situation happened exactly according to his care and according to his plan. The order of service that we have is printed in the bulletin. It's also available on the screen this morning. We welcome those who are joining us online as well. Please note that as part of our service today that we will be celebrating the Lord's Supper. There are notes on that in the worship folder. We'll begin this morning with our opening hymn. That hymn is hymn 34. Now sing we, now rejoice. God's blessings on your worship. Please rise. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. 
For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. Almighty God, in mercy, you sent your one and only Son to take upon himself our human nature. By his gracious coming, deliver us from the corruption of our sin and transform us into the likeness of his glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. First scripture lesson from Isaiah chapter 45, we see the, the care and the concern for God not only to make a promise, to keep a promise, but to proclaim in crystal clear words that he is our salvation and our righteousness. Gather together and come. Assemble, you fugitives from the nations. Ignorant are those who carry about idols of wood, who pray to gods that cannot save. Declare what is to be, present it, let them take counsel together. Who foretold this long ago? Who declared it from distant past? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no God apart from me, a righteous God, a Savior. There is none but me. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. I have sworn, I have, by myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity a word that will not be revoked. Before me every knee will bow, by me every tongue will swear. They will say of me, in the Lord alone are righteousness and strength. 
All who have raged against him will come to him and be put to shame. But in the Lord, all the descendants of Israel will be found righteous and will exalt. This is the word of our God. Join this morning in the Psalm of the Day, Psalm 111. We'll sing the first half of the verses and the congregation responding in the second half as we join together in the refrain and the glory be. second lesson is Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, beginning at verse 12. Here we see how the, the joy of Christmas is not ending, it is beginning for the believer. And in that joy, we live it out in our lives. We are bearers of that good news to the world. The world has that opportunity to see and to hear it in our lives. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body you are called to peace and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. As you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Word of God.
rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Gospel is recorded in Matthew chapter 2, the selected verses. And while we hear that the angels had announced good news that would be for all people, not all people received it as such. And in fact, Herod took it quite in the opposite way. With hatred and anger and rage, he tried to destroy what God had brought about. But again, we see God's care and concern for completing his plan perfectly. When they had gone, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, in dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, he will be called a Nazarene. This is the gospel of our Lord. Join in the hymn of the day, hymn 41, singing verses 1 to 4. Please be seated. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ our Savior, do you happen to know what historically the Christian church has called this first Sunday after Christmas? It's been called Slaughter of the Innocents Sunday. Slaughter of the Innocents. That might sound a little bit shocking. Some have, have softened it to call it the, the Feast of the Holy Innocents, which sounds a little bit nicer. 
But it's a, a title that gets its name from the verses left out of our text where King Herod sent his soldiers to the town of Bethlehem to kill all the baby boys under the age of two to quell what he thought was a threat to his throne. That title, Slaughter of the Innocent, certainly doesn't go along with the warm, fuzzy celebration of Christmas you and I are used to. Of course, nothing about 2020 has been overly warm and fuzzy, has it? Nor does that grisly thought of a king who is so insecure and power-hungry that he was willing to kill innocent children just to maintain his power. Those are thoughts we don't want to have to associate with our our Christmas celebration. Maybe that's why that title hasn't really been all that popularized. I think what's interesting about the Bible is that it doesn't cover over atrocity or shy away from giving us vivid descriptions of the brutality that God's people face in life. Yes, this is an account that's on the darker side of the Christmas story. Having just celebrated the high of Christmas Eve and the the festival of Christmas Day, it's quite a a crash for us to come face to face with the low of a king who was so bent on destroying Jesus, he was willing to kill innocent children to do it. I mean, Herod didn't care about collateral damage. Didn't care about the pain or suffering that all of those families would have had to face. He was bent only on destroying Jesus. Yet I would submit, I wonder if there's any account that more aptly applies the blessings of Christmas into our lives. The world into which Jesus entered was a world that was brutal, immoral, and power-hungry. It was full of injustice, pain, and suffering. And it's no different in our world today. But God cared for Jesus then. God cares for you today. In fact, God cared so much for Jesus, cared so much for you, that he used his divine wisdom and his almighty power to protect Jesus and to keep him safe on that path for which he had come into this world, which is to win salvation for you and for me. I pray that God bless our study of his word today. And that we're able at all times and in every situation to remember that one fact, God cares for you. Now, while what Herod did might have been shocking to us, it really shouldn't surprise us. When those wise men came from the east to report to Herod that they had seen the star of the one who was born king of the Jews, he was caught way off guard. Technically, he was the king of the Jews, although he had not come by that naturally. He had usurped the throne of David and wasn't even a Jew. The worst part for Herod in hearing that message from the Magi was that it appeared God had now brought into the world the rightful heir to that throne. And to Herod, that was a threat. And so he acted exactly the way we would expect a tyrant king who had a long history of ruthlessly dealing with dissent and threat to act. He set out to destroy Jesus and eliminate a future threat to his throne. Maybe what's so shocking to us is we just can't imagine receiving Jesus that way. I mean, we just celebrated Christmas in joy and and with thanksgiving because God's opened our eyes to see the light of salvation that comes through Jesus. We were full of song and, and rejoicing because God's allowed us to see Jesus didn't come to establish an earthly kingdom, but rather a spiritual kingdom. Our Our singing was so full of praise and and worship because we know the salvation that Jesus brings through his life and and death on the cross that would culminate in an empty tomb on Easter Sunday morning. Yet this account reminds us not everyone receives Jesus that way. 
Satan also knew the exact reason why Jesus had come into this world. And he started right from the very beginning to try and knock Jesus off of that path. He fueled the hatred and the jealousy inside of of Herod that would lead him to try and eliminate this threat. It's no different in our world today. There's darkness all around us. While you and I join the angels and the shepherds in worshiping and praising our, our newborn king, there are many who still see Jesus as a threat, a threat to their, to their egos and their desires. There are many people in our world that want to be Lord of their own lives. They want to be able to do their own thing, make their own choices, however they feel best and appropriate for their lives. They want to be able to take credit themselves for their salvation. They want to be able to believe God will love them no matter what they do, how they live, or how successful they are. There are even those who will go out and do the exact thing God commanded us not to do, just to show that they can. I mean, even looking at our text, we, we shudder at hearing all of those innocent children that were slaughtered. In reality, it was probably a relatively small number, maybe 15 to 20, given the size of Bethlehem. Compare that to the millions in our world that are killed through abortion each year. And the number of people in our country that not only celebrate that fact, but, but protect someone's right to choose that option. There are still many people who see Jesus and his message as a threat and seek to destroy him. Of course, they, they don't destroy Jesus the same way Herod tried to. They do it by discrediting him and his message and his followers. They Condescend, look condescendingly on anybody who would be so, so weak and foolish as to need someone else to win salvation for them. They resort to name-calling to try and, and discredit those who would follow after Jesus. Yes, many in our world still see Jesus as a threat, but God cared for Jesus then, and God cares for you today. He didn't let Herod destroy Jesus. He cared for Jesus' physical welfare by going to Joseph and instructing him to take Mary and the child and flee to Egypt. Yes, Jesus had come into this world to die, but it was not his time yet to do so. He still had work on this earth to do. He had to be that perfect child for every time that you and I were not perfectly obedient as children. He had to be a perfectly respectful teenager for all the times that we were not. He had to be a, a perfect carpenter for all the times we were less than perfectly faithful at our jobs. God the Father could not allow Jesus to die as an innocent child. As it had been prophesied, he would die on a cross. So to do everything as God had planned and promised... And to pay for our sins, he needed to live that perfect life and 33 years later die on the cross. And so God intervened. He had Joseph take Mary and the child and flee to Egypt. And so you see, in caring for Jesus' physical welfare, he was also caring for your spiritual welfare. He kept Jesus on the mission for which he had come into this world, which was your salvation and mine. He was thinking about all that Jesus had yet to do so that he could take care of your sins and make you his son or daughter. God would not let the malice, the insecurity, the hatred of Herod rob the world of the peace he intended to bring through his son. And so in protecting Jesus from the wickedness and the evil of this world, he was caring for you. And so Jesus went forward to live that perfect life. And he offered that perfect life as a sacrifice on Calvary's cross. And because of that, God now forgives your sins. 
you and I no longer have to live in fear of death. We no longer have to worry about the punishment of hell. Jesus, our Savior, already faced that for us. That's why we celebrate Christmas with such joy and such thanksgiving. We see God's love in setting his plan in action to bring about our salvation. God cares for you. You know, I can't help but thinking about what Mary and Joseph must have been thinking as all of this was happening. I mean, they, their world was about to be rocked again. They'd already gone through a lot. After Mary having to, to come to grips with the fact that she was going to be pregnant outside of marriage and all that would entail in their society, and then finding out it was going to be conceived by the Holy Spirit and her child would be the, the, the long-awaited for promised Messiah, after Joseph going through that whole deliberation process and then deciding to quietly divorce Mary and then having the Holy Spirit instruct him to take her as his wife and all that would entail after taking a trip to Bethlehem with a very pregnant wife and finding no, no place for them to stay except a barn and having their baby born there and, and, and placed in a manger and after the worship of the shepherds and the, the wise men. Mary and Joseph must have been at the point where they were done with the excitement. I envision them being at that place of just wanting to rest a little bit and, and get rid of the excitement. Yet God said that's not to be. When Joseph laid his head down that night, he had no idea what was coming next. Get up, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. They had no time to prepare, get ready for the trip. They had to leave, and they had to leave right then and there. They had no idea where they were going. They had no idea what lay ahead for them. They knew only the king was trying to kill their son, and they had to leave instantly. Yet Joseph didn't challenge God, didn't question him. He just followed God's lead. And God cared for them. Egypt was a place many Jews had fled for refuge. There was a Jewish community there where Mary and Joseph could settle and feel secure. Those costly gifts from the wise men they could use to, to finance their trip and their stay in Egypt. Even as they came back and found out that, that Herod's son was on the throne, who was even more ruthless than his dad, God directed them back to the land of Nazareth in fulfillment of his promise and prophecy where Jesus could grow. And in all of this, we see one thing. God cared for his people. You know, one of the attributes we appreciate about our God is that he's unchanging. He's changeless. That means just as God cared for his people then, he continues to care for his people today. With all the wickedness and suffering and injustice that there is in our world today, maybe you've been at the same spot where I speculate Mary and Joseph might have been. Where you've, you've suffered through enough and you sat down with God and you said, God, I've had enough. I can't take any more. I want it just to be over so I can have some peace. And God's answer was, oh, just wait. This is just the beginning. You haven't seen anything yet. And yet God saw you through that challenge. He walked with you. He cared for you. He used his divine wisdom, his almighty power to protect you, to guide you, to, to care for you. He kept his promise to be with you always, even if that meant walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Through all of it, God, God cared for you. Right? We're, we're reminded how even God can use the wickedness and the evil of this world to move his people where he wants them to be and, and to shape them to be the people he wants them to be. God cares for you. 
What a comforting thought that is as we prepare to enter into a new year this coming week. We're always excited for a new year because it often brings new hope. Right? The thought of something new brings the possibility of something better. Except we've lived in this world long enough to know new doesn't always mean better. It can be a little scary to think about what the new year might hold. We might even shudder to wonder what God might ask us to face in this new year. I mean, who of us a year ago could have ever possibly imagined what God was going to have us face in 2020? Again, yet here we are. God saw us through that year. God walked with us and and brought us to the beginning of a new year. This lesson today just reminds us that even though we look to Jesus as our Savior, and even though we know the peace of sins forgiven and being reconciled with God, that doesn't mean that we'll face peace on earth and a life of glory here. We live in the same world Jesus lived in. That's a world that comes with hurt, pain, sorrow, and grief. Violence and war still rule in our world. Injustice, suffering, pain are all around us. I don't know what the next year will bring for you. But I know this. God knows. And God cares. You might remember many years ago that song from Bette Midler where she sang about God watching us from a distance. Kind of portrayed God as being a little bit aloof and distant from his people, um, watching from a distance, mildly interested in what was happening, but not enough to get involved. My friends, that couldn't be any further from the truth. God knows, and God cares. And God will walk with you through whatever challenge and suffering you might have to face this coming year. In fact, I'd submit those challenges and sufferings are some of the best opportunities for us to witness to the love and faith of our Savior. They allow us to witness to our faith without even using words. Because they help others see the tangible benefits of faith. That despite the challenges, despite the wickedness, despite whatever we have to face, in faith we cling tightly to a Savior who promised to keep us tightly close to Him. Slaughter of the Innocents may not be the warm, fuzzy Christmas celebration that we think of. Probably isn't what you were expecting when you gathered in God's house today. But what an opportunity for us to be realistic about the world that we live in, and to see the light of the gospel shining in all its clarity and brilliance as we focus on Jesus, our Savior. I don't know what the next year will bring for you, but through the darkness, I know this. I know God knows, and I know God cares for you. Hold tightly to that promise as you step boldly into a new year. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Having heard God's word, we have opportunity to make confession of our faith. We do that today using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, 
and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. We'll remain standing as we go to our Lord in prayer this morning. Just a note on our offerings uh, as well as the friendship cards. You may place those in the basket in the back on the credenza as you leave or take advantage of the opportunities to give online. The instructions are there on the bottom of page 12. We go to our Lord in prayer as we speak the responsive prayer of the church. Lord God, Heavenly Father, creator and sustainer of the universe, we praise you for the special love you have shown us, your fallen and sinful creatures. Lord Jesus Christ, we marvel at your servant-like heart, which moved you to do your Father's will and take on our flesh. O Holy Spirit, we thank you for your saving work of bringing us to faith in our newborn Savior. God of our salvation, as you have brought us to faith in the Christ child, so we ask that you would work powerfully also in the hearts of those who do not yet know him or who do not know him in truth. Grant that the world's attention to Christmas may not just be a seasonal event, but rather a celebration of the gift of salvation. Gracious Father, this morning we pray for our friend James Kemp, who will be undergoing open-heart surgery on January 6th. Lord, as you cared for your son, we ask that you would continue to care for James, be with the doctors and all who are attending to him, that, there may bring, that you may bring about healing to his body through this procedure, and use this opportunity to strengthen his faith and to look to you as his Lord and Savior, his Good Shepherd, all his days. And let the joyous message of Christmas be preached in all the world, and may it find ready acceptance in believing hearts for the eternal benefit of lost souls, for the extension of your kingdom, and for the glory of your holy name. We ask this through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Continue with the sacrament portion of our service, and we greet one another. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. When the time had fully come, he sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God 
in the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another. And serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. You may be seated as we join in our closing hymn.
Good morning. What a joy to be with you here this morning, and pray God's blessings upon your week as we continue to celebrate the joy of Christmas. Thank you, Pastor, and even Owen, for encouraging us and, and reminding us how God's love truly cares for us and surrounds us no matter the situations in life. So thank you for sharing that today. A couple of things on the calendar to note this week. On Tuesday will be the funeral, visitation and funeral for Francis Modell. And then on Thursday we have a New Year's Eve service at 5.30 p.m. Uh, you can take note of the other Bible studies and things that are starting up uh, coming in the new year on the other announcement pages. I have two letters to read to the congregation. And I don't know what order I was going to read them in, so I guess they're the order that's on the page right here, and I'll just start that way. Uh, this is from Mrs. Amy Van Evenoven, someone you might know. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, after prayerful deliberation and guidance from the Holy Spirit, I'm writing to accept the call you have extended me to continue permanently teaching fifth grade in this gospel ministry I ask for your prayers and support as I continue serving your children, families, and community with God's word. It has been a privilege to join you in carrying out Jesus' precious command to make disciples of all nations by teaching them the precious word of God. I am thankful for the opportunity to continue ministry with you at St. Matthew's Lutheran School. God's blessings, Amy Van Hevenhoven. So, Amy is here. Hands, even like, where, where is it? All can't see it. Well, oh, back row. All right. Humbly so. Welcome. We're glad to, glad to have you with us. So, Our second from the guy up top there. Not that, that guy up top there. Mr. Eric Paulson. says, Dear pastors and members of St. Matthew's, I would like to thank everyone for their support and prayers while I prayerfully considered the call to teach at LPS. It seems like just yesterday that I was blessed to join St. Matthew's as your 5th and 6th grade teacher. My family has been blessed in so many different ways during my service here. God has used you to remind me once more of his undeserved love for us all. It is with mixed emotions that I have been led by the Holy Spirit to accept the Lord's call to teach at Luther Preparatory School. It is a blessed opportunity to teach his lambs and equip them with the power of God's word encouraging them to pursue full-time service in his church. God has given me great peace with this decision, and I will continue to pray to the Lord of the church that he fills the position of my acceptance of this call creates here at St. Matthew's. May God continue to bless the gospel efforts here at St. Matthew's. In Christ, Eric Paulson. I pray God's blessings be with you as you begin this new chapter of ministry in Watertown at Luther Preparatory School. We'll have the opportunity to, uh, to uh, I guess, greet them uh, today as they are part of our service here, and may God bless you in the week ahead. Pastor Van Evenhoven will greet you in the fireside room, and I will dismiss you down the aisle. God be with you.